Welcome back to Following Noah Donna Stormlight Podcast. This week is episode 189, and we are finishing Mistborn Secret History, our secret glimpse into Mistborn Era 1. Elliot, how are you? I am doing quite well. I, I may have said this already on previous episodes, but I'm a little mind boggled by this story. It's a uh, it's a challenging one to to wrap your brain around, but enjoyable nonetheless. Paul, oh. uh, yet yeah, uh, Elliot said it pretty well. There's there's a lot here, and this is way more of a full length thing than I guess I was anticipating. But it, it, it's wonderful. Excited to to dive in to the secret history. With this episode, we truly are wrapping up Mistborn Era One. That. There isn't anything else really to read about Mistborn Era 1, which we we did read the 11th medal, but I don't think we ever... My brain is all fuzzy. Did we record the 11th medal and never release it, or did we never record the 11th medal? Do you guys remember? I remember talking to you about it, Trevor. I don't remember if we were recording or if that was a side conversation. I remember reading it. I remember chatting about it. I don't know if it's on air. I don't remember if we talked about it or not. Do you remember even reading it, Paul? <laughs> You're giving me quite the blank stare over there. I was going to say, uh, I, it's like the Gandalf meme of like, I have no memory of this. Place, <laughs> you know, I am confident that I've read it. Right. I, I'm pretty like my heart is telling me I'm confident that we've recorded an episode on this. However, I'm now questioning all of that. Maybe me, me too. I don't remember. Maybe this is a Mandela effect thing. I have no idea. I don't remember no, if we actually no. recorded. Because I'm, I'm very confident we did not release it. But I'm, I'm okay. questioning if we ever recorded it. But anyway, with this episode, we have wrapped up Mistborn Era One. Let's roll intro, and then we'll talk about. It. All right, Elliot, brief history, brief summary of the entirety of Era 1, go. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this, this uh, parts 5 and 6 of Secret History, go ahead. Almost as daunting a chance to try and summarize yeah. <laughs> Secret History as, as Era 1, but yeah, a few less events. So, Part 5 and Part 6 takes us through the end of the story. We pick up with Kelsier in part five, just kind of walking through the jungle. He's just striking out in the, the direction he's been told to go, trying to find the Irie. And in chapter two, he finds the Irie, and they are in a fortress, and they've got some cool gadgets and things, and they seem to know a lot about the Cosmere and shards, and they've got some grand plans to ascend to preservation, apparently, although maybe there's some politics at play or what else? A lot of little Easter egg drops, which I'm sure I caught maybe like a third of them would be my guess. Uh, they strike out the Irie strike out from that fortress to head to the mainland, I guess, to go ascend to preservation. And Kelsier pulls all kinds of tricks on them and captures from them their device that they have, which they're going to use to ascend and become preservation. So Kelsier now has the device. Kelsier scampers back to uh, Scadrill mainland place and catches up with Vin and Ellen and the rest of the crew kind of catches up with what's going on, sees how things are, are going. He learns a lot about hemallergy and spook and marsh and everybody else. And then preservation dies and Kelsier decides to smash the device he's got in his hand and he connects with preservation and becomes preservation or vessel of preservation or something to that effect. So Kelsier is a shard effectively for a little bit of time, I guess, and does a little battle with, uh, with ruin it is pretty instrumental in the events of hero of ages is able to give his power up to Vin 
as we know Vin ascends to preservation, and then Kelsier kind of witnesses the Sander Lanch of the Hero of Ages, and we get to see some kind of wrap up for Vin, Ellen, Spook, and the whole thing. Good addition. You know good addition to Mistborn Era One or bad? I'll, I'll, I'll say. Think that, I'll let it go. Sorry. I'll you just throw out. Said to talk. So. <laughs> Do I do want to hear what you are what you are thinking, Paul? Your thoughts are fairly short, in that I think it's a big, I think it's a very helpful addition. There, I finished the entirety of Era One, feeling like there was something missing, and this fills in those gaps for me. That there were bits of of Era One that just kind of left me wanting, or slightly confused, or thinking, "Oh man, there there had to be more to that." Well, yeah, there is. It's in secret history. So getting the, the backstory is, was actually really helpful for me to process and feel a little bit better about all of Era 1, actually. Uh, I feel a resounding yes. I think this is a very good addition. Um, I wouldn't say it's mandatory. You know, it's not like everyone who reads Mistborn Era 1 has to read this. However, I would encourage anyone who reads Mistborn Era 1 to read this. I think it makes um, an excellent addition to to Era 1. And uh, I think it's wonderful. Um, what I was going to say a second ago, just, just as, you know... <laughs> Like if you <laughs> Elliot's uh, chapter summary, I feel like if you read that summary to, uh, I wish I could see a reaction. This is impossible, but I wish I could see a reaction of us as we started our Cosmere journey, like early Way of Kings, way back. You know, just hearing that like summary of two uh, a couple chapters. You know. Um, that like all this crazy stuff that happens in these couple chapters, you know, like hearing that early on, or even doesn't have to be that far back, but like whenever we started Mistborn era one, you know, like hearing that would sound absolutely ludicrous, absolutely ridiculous and crazy. And you'd just be like, what, you know? And that's what I was thinking the whole time of how, how, how wild of a scale we're, we're at of the things that are happening. So, my two thoughts on secret history is I disagree with you, Paul. I think it is mandatory. I think in order to get the full punch of Mistborn Era 1, you have to read this. However, at the time Sanderson writes this, he's very much comfortable with tying in other things. So when I read secret history, I come across the IRE. I haven't read Elantris, which we'll talk about in a second. I am thinking to myself, okay, I'm clearly missing something. I'm cl this is this is going over my head, and I've read all of Mistborn, so I did feel intimidated by Secret History because of the Irie. We'll talk about the Irie in a second, but do you guys now are you keying into why we read Elantris when we did? and how the format of the podcast kind of unfolded itself moving into this episode specifically? 100%. Definitely things at least understood a reference to here because of Alanzas and now, you know, conjecture a little bit about what all that means. Whereas, yeah, without Alanzas, I'd be I'd be rather lost as to what was happening here. Although I still kind of feel that way. We've yes. read a lot of Cosmere at this point, and there's still things in here that I'm like, man, is there a reference here I don't get? Like I've read most of the other stuff. What 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 am I missing? I I felt similarly. Like I knew that there were ties to Elantris. But honestly, that came from whenever I heard someone's expression of like, oh Domai. Or oh yep. yeah, um, yep. Ado Stomai or whatever whatever the quote is exactly. That was really my my key moment of like, okay, these people are from Elantris originally, yep. or maybe that character, or maybe they all are. 
I feel like the assumption is they all are, but I was still not certain, and that's was probably the biggest thing I wanted. One of the biggest things I wanted to talk to y'all about, ask y'all about, is what the heck? What's <laughs> going on? <laughs> you know, is is this? Um, are these people all from Elantris? Why are they all here? I guess. It, it, sorry. Also, one other thing. Another reason they did know this was Elantris was they referenced. Div- Devotion. They did, believe, yep. Right. Yep. They referenced devotion. Um and such. So so there there were some giveaways, but I it doesn't answer to me why they're here. My my thought is I'm like, are these the ghost bloods, but not the ghost bloods? Like is it a similar group or function or the precursor? The, yeah, yes, the precursor kind of thing to the ghost bloods. I'm I, I'm just at a loss a little bit, so I'm curious to know what y'all think. What's going on? Do you, Elliot? Do you have any thoughts before I mansplain to you? I do want the the explanation, yes, and to throw in some of my thoughts on the Irie. But before we even do that, I was going to mention I'd be really curious about someone's experience if they hear me out on this. I. I like long form fantasy, right? Stormlight Archive is my is my jam. Hundred page story, let's go, let's do it. I I read Secret History, and part of me is like, man, I wish all of that was just in Mistborn Era One. Yep. It give me some cutaway chapters to cognitive Shadow Kelsier and tell me what he's about. Now, obviously, you ruin some of the suspense, I guess. And some of the the surprises that you get reveals of in secret history don't happen because if you get told it in the in the moment, perhaps. But I guess I'd, I'd say I don't necessarily would want Sanderson to inject it directly into Era. But I'd love to get someone's experience of that. If we like edited it in for them and said, "Hey, pause after this chapter and go read this chapter in, in secret, secret history," but I'm not any sure. further. But you have to read this chapter oh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. this chapter and then yeah. Very carefully. Yep. That would that would be a very interesting experience I'd love someone to go through. Okay. So the IRE. This m- most of this has been words of Brandon for you, and I'm c- just kind of summarize. Because when Secret History came out, you could obviously guess there's lots of questions uh, that he was asked based on um this book. So, the Irie are Elantrians. They are Elantrians that left Elantris before the fall of Andor. Okay? So, Andor was still active and functional before they left. Okay? They they went through their magic portal on the mountainside um, and they're exploring the cognitive realm. One of the big reveals in this, just by the existence of the Irie, is that the Elantrians can function with their magic outside of Elantris. Because if you remember in Elantris, the Aeon Door is very geographically tied. You have to draw Elantris yeah. for it to work. You have to be in Elantris for it to work. And the reason why it breaks is because there's an earthquake, there's a chasm, it changes the physical landscape. So, the Irie, it would seem, have discovered a way to travel the Cosmere with their powers, because they're, they are fully fledged Elantrians. They have the light blue skin, they don't have like the zombie green skin of fallen Andor. They are Elantrians. However, they have figured out a way to access Andor outside of Elantris. That is the big reveal here. Understand? Yes. Okay. So, we know it's possible that you can now... We we don't know how, and... Which leads me into the second part. What is with the Elantrians' glowy orbs? We didn't get any of that in Elantris, but now we've seen the Lighthouse Keeper and Oathbringer, and in Secret History now... They've just got glowy orbs that do whatever the plot needs. Like it, yeah. it alters your connection 
or it manipulates your capital C connection so that Kelsier can take up preservation. He manipulates his he manipulates his own connection, and that was the intention of what the Irie were going to do. The Irie have zero connection to preservation. They're not from Scandriel. Kelsier at least has a little bit, right? The Irie were intending on using this glowy orb, manipulating their capital C connection to preservation, take it upon themselves. Do you guys remember what the glowy orb in Oathbringer does? I don't. I, I remember us briefly mentioning again that the, it's an interlude chapter, right? With some random guy? No, it's um, Kaladin, Adolin, Shallan thrown into Shadesmar after Elokar dies. They're wandering around Shadesmar trying to get to the, the um, Yurithiru, or I'm sorry, um, Thalen City, but they don't know they need to get to Thalen City. They find a lighthouse, lighthouse keeper guy, Ryano, Ryano. Um, they walk into his hut. Ryano assumes Kaladin is from Nalthus originally because he sees that he's invested, but then he's like, oh, wait, no, the, the Knights Radiant have returned. That's big news. And then Kaladin uses his investiture to activate this glowy orb. Glowy orb shows Kaladin Dalinar. Shows Dalinar is in trouble. Dalinar needs help. And he's going to be in Thalen City. So it kind of gives him a glimpse of the future, maybe capital F fortune. Okay, because that was a term that was brought up in this episode, right? Are you guys tracking? So what's with yep. what's with Come the Elan what's with the Elantrians glowy orbs? Naturally, anytime I find a glowy something that we that's a mystery, naturally a dawn shard. Dawn shard. So okay. That's what I've been thinking about this whole time. Uh -huh. But no, this was a big question I had of like. Yeah, like this this orb seems to be such a mystery. And I I don't understand anything about how it came to be, if it was made, if it was found. Yeah, I was I was pretty lost on this one. To be TBH honest, I was pretty lost. What what if? And I started to put this theory together just from reading the the secret history chapters. But the, the more you talk, Trevor, the more I'm I'm leaning into it. What if? What if the Elantrians here, the, the Henri in this secret history case, have found a way to bottle up connection. Somehow, like in, in Kelsier's example situation, they they somehow got a hold of some connection to preservation. I don't know if you could maybe like capture somebody who has a lot of connection and somehow, I don't know, steal that connection or copy and paste that connection. I don't know. They've gotten that connection somehow stored in the device. So then in, in Kelsier's instance, he can release that connection, take that connection, and then ascend. Maybe in Kaladin's case, it could be the same deal. It's, a, it's an orb that has connection to a shard, somebody, stored up in there. And so when Kaladin can... That's going to be the wrong word. When Kaladin accesses it, he is just linked with a shard momentarily, which then gives him access to fortune, which then sees the future. Feasible, follow? yeah. I do follow. The They talk about fortune and connection in this part of Secret History. And if you think about it, Oathbringer's publication date is fairly close to Secret History, right? Secret History comes out in 2016, Oathbringer comes out in 2017 or 18, maybe. I don't remember. One of those two. So at this point, Sanderson is really trying to get the reader used to capital C connection, capital, capital F fortune. We know because I've told you guys that Hoyd has some crazy amount of fortune somehow. That's 
that's the explanation for how Hoyd can be where he needs to be, is because he has access to capital F fortune. So, what we see the IRE doing here is manipulating, if not harnessing, connection and fortune, right? So, with their glowy orbs. So, on our uh, Elantris episode, I made the claim that the Elantrians were the most powerful investiture users. And I had more information than you did, I suppose. But um, <laughs> with, with that spelled out, the, the, I think the most powerful world hoppers at this point are Elantrians. And I don't think that's a crazy statement to claim. I, th I think that's pretty uncontested. They obviously seem to know the most. Like, by far, so. I mean, we have a couple of other examples to compare to. Not that we need to do a whole, like, rundown, but we've seen some Nalthus, Nal Nalthians? Would you use that term? Nalthinians? <laughs> sure. Nalthanonians? <laughs> Nalthanites? <laughs> <laughs> those people. We've seen those people do magic. And seem to carry around some power. We've seen what we think could maybe be some ferrochemy, perhaps, or some ghost bloods doing some some funky stuff uh, around. But but yeah, the, the Elantrians, at least here in, in Secret History, seem to be like at their full force. Yeah, they're 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 here. They're ready to to make some big moves with shards and all kinds of things. And yet they're spooked by scary Kelsier in the trees. Yes. Yeah. Hey, they think he's ruined. I'd be pretty scared of ruin too. It's true, I guess. What did you, what did you guys think of like the plot of of Secret History of Kelsier running around exploring the Cosmere with you, and then at the end he sits down with Spook. Is it our epilogue or the last chapter where he convinces Spook to put in a spike or an earring, and then Kelsier shows up in the room giving. Spook some, you know, PTSD of like, oh, it's it's ruined again. He's back. No, it's it's actually Kelsier this time. So the secret history ends with, hey, Spook, let's discover the secrets of the Cosmere together, and that's how we're going to be handed off into Mistborn Era Two. I thought that was pretty cool. My, I mean, my question going in was, how are we going to see? Uh, the transition of Kelsier. Are we going to see that? And I feel like this, although I honestly kind of wanted to see it more deliberate, it did get, provide that that window of like, oh yeah, we're going to go figure out the Cosmere, you know? And what if we play around with these spikes? I don't know. Sounds sounds fun, I guess. Um, yeah. So, so you get that... Um, I also thought this this specifically the scene with Spook was really funny because while we were reading Era One, I feel like we kept asking like part of the question I was asking of like, is this somehow Kelsier talking or is this Ruin? And we completely settled and knew like this is Ruin talking to Spook. You know, he's been spiked and all these things, but it's all from the perspective of like Kelsier is talking to him. And so I just think that's funny and kind of ironic that we're seeing now where Kelsier is actually talking to spook because like i don't know poor spook he's just been thrown through the ringer like yes <laughs> with with all this like how do you ever trust that this is actually kelsier you know so i thought that was funny because that was something that we'd been talking about before the we get a a key piece of dialogue that i pointed out in miss born era one for you guys and Elliot, you were a little confused by it. When Spook wakes up from his, our last chapter with Spook, he has the knowledge of spikes make you influenced by ruin. That's really important. And Spook is awakened by some dialogue that says, you have a secret no one else does. Send it to Vin. I need you to send this to Vin. You have, you have the secret. Send it flying for me. Well, in secret history, that's... Spook and Kelsey are sitting on a hillside talking, and that's pretty cool to me. Yet another example of Brandon's incredible foresight. I came up with a term for this, and now I forget Forsandering? it. Forsandering? Yeah. 
Sander yeah. shadowing. That's right. Yeah, Sander shadowing for for Sander. What, whatever term we came up for that. I, you got to keep in mind the, the publication dates here. Yep. Yep. This is like eight years later. He comes back and writes this and fills in that gap. But it's not. It's not just him going back and reading like, oh, okay, how can I fill in the gaps here? Like, I'm sure it's some of that. But there's also stuff he planted, I I think, clearly intending to come back and, and revisit it later. He, he had it all in his head, or at least some of it. it. It's impressive. Did you guys read the postscript by Brandon for Secret History? I did. I believe so, yes. Sanderson quickly addresses the issue of you know like bringing dead characters back to life and how that's a dangerous trope mm-hmm. to use and he's like yeah but i wanted to do it anyway with kelsier because i knew i had more to do with kelsier so with with that in mind elliot you came out of miss Era one questioning everything because you knew kelsier yeah. was coming back somehow but kelsier was yeah. dead so does anybody actually die, or what? Is, what happens in the Cosmere? What's going on now? At the end of Secret History, we get closure on Vin and Ellen, right? We we get it. We get a direct answer. Vin and Ellen did have the opportunity. They were invested enough to have the opportunity to become a cognitive shadow, running around with Kelsier. And what do they choose? They choose the to the peaceful go into the beyond. Yep. And, you know, um, which I I appreciate Brandon bringing this up about characters being killed off or not killed off or things like that because yeah, that was a big question and, and really was felt very important to me at least if I was kind of concerned of like okay do any of our characters actually die or are right. they just if you're a good guy and you're invested you're per- basically immortal, like maybe even more immortal than like our shards or something. So I appreciated that. And I'm, I could totally be behind, like this is the story he had for Kelsier kind of thing. And taking that as more individual or specific than like all of our characters. I'm, I'm definitely picking up on a Cosmere uh, wild theme of death is not necessarily what you think it is. We've we've seen it with characters like Syl. We've seen it with just yeah, straight up characters coming back like Yasna and Kelsier. And even like I wanna say like Warbreaker, you know, changes some of like how you think about death and what what do they call them? The returned? Yep. Is uh, is what they're called. It, it seems like a seems like a theme. Seems like a theme across the wider Cosmere of death is not necessarily the end, n- nor is it a ceasing to exist. I, for one, was with you, Elliot. I needed closure on Vin. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. When I read Mistborn, I hadn't read Rhythm of War, so I had no, in- I had no reveal that Kelsey was still around for myself. So on reading Secret History, you pretty immediately you're like, wait, is no one actually dead or do they just run around the cognitive realm forever? And then when you get to the end of it, you're like, okay, well, if you're super invested, you might have the opportunity to do that if you can talk a shard into stapling you to the power. But Vin and Ellen choose to go into the beyond together. And Vin turns to Kelsey and gives him a little paragraph on love and how he needs to learn something about love and friendship. Well, hold on. Or maybe, maybe just miss said it. Vin delivers that line to Kelsey. Is that not what I said? I think you said Ellen. Sorry. She, yeah. Vin, Vin, she, she, yeah, Vin gives it to Kelsier as Ellen is leaving. Vin leaves with him. Yeah. And she drops a bit of a bomb she does. on yep. Kelsier there right at the end. That, that, was, that was a little sharp. What she kind of challenges him with, she kind of you know, calls him out. 
he he's just kind of begging her to stay like i'm i'm lonely stay with me and then basically says hey man you got a lot to learn about love see ya yep i i absolutely loved that part so what, what taking one step back i was going to say my favorite part about secret history and what i think the best part of it is, is that it gives us the closure with all those characters and all those moments that that I feel like the main series book didn't exactly have. We didn't have like a closure conversation with Vin at the end. Like she ascended and then defeated Ruin, and we get we get mentioned from Caesar that her and Ellen are happy where they are, and that's. That's a decent closure, but this is more of the like the end of the book dialogue, peaceful dialogue, I guess, that you would hope for or look for. Um, which I loved. I think Brandon Sanderson does such a fantastic job of writing these moments, these like really big moments that in my head it would be very, very, very daunting to try and write. Uh, like, how do you write the closure final conversation between these these huge characters you know so i really appreciated it i thought it was really really good and it was neat to see vin's we we see vin is like a fully matured you know patient grown up i don't know she's been through so much and it was really neat to see her confidence and her confidence in her understanding and her understanding of love specifically was really sweet and, and really just a great moment, you know, um, her teaching the teacher a lesson, I guess, you know, um, like Kelsier was part of what made her the mistborn that we know her, but uh, she is really developed into such a special character individual character that that was really special to see and this is where we get to see that i think this is the scene that i would most have wanted in the actual mistborn era one books however i don't think you could pick just this scene i think you'd have to have a lot of the stuff with it in order to have this scene you know but yeah that's that that's a great thought that i didn't that i didn't actually think about so much of era one is about Vin maturing from from this child who sees no worth or value in herself to, like you just said, a, an adult, someone who is confident, knows what they knows what they believe, knows who they are, and such that I think she surpasses Kelsier in some of that. She she reaches a level of maturity. Think about you know end of of Hero of Ages where Ruin kills Elend, and and Vin just goes, I can accept that. It hurts, it's hard, but I I loved him and we had our time and I can accept that. And Kelsier can't, Kelsier can't move past that, and that's what Vin is like you know kind of shooting some barbs at him. What a what a moment to see Vin mature so far that she surpasses. Who was kind of handing down some of that confidence to her? Do you guys remember at the end of the final empire what Kelsier's last words to Vin are? Uh, he says, "He says I am hope, but that's not to Vin, is it?" No, that's to the crowd and to the, the Lord Ruler. When Spook and Demu are no the the Condra. Are, are captured in the prison gates and they're going to go be executed, Vin says, no, don't do this. Don't, don't sacrifice yourself. Kelsey turns to her and says, you have a lot to learn about friendship, Vin. Hmm. And so then at the end of Secret History, Vin is accepting her own death, accepting her life with Ellen, turns to him and said, you have a lot to learn about love. And this is what I was going to answer about. Does secret history add to Era 1? Like, these are the things that make Era 1 as a whole feel much more satisfying. There, there, were, there was something missing from just the trilogy. But when you add secret history, it really rounds out some of the, the themes and the characters for me. Like Kelsey and 
and VIN now that we've talked about it specifically? Big question in the fan circles. How on earth do you adapt secret history? Yeah. Do you include it in a Mistborn blockbuster or do you have to revisit it? And how on earth would you do that? Because like you're saying, Paul, this last scene with Vin and, Vin and Kelsier, I think is extremely important to put into the story and to adapt Mistborn without it, I think would be really lacking, right? What you finished like your blockbuster trilogy, Vin and Ellen die, you, you've created the new world. But because of this scene, I think secret history is essential, as I said, to read. So how on earth do you approach an adaptation of it? Uh, I will actually push on this a little bit. I think this, the, the part where I'm saying like the last, you know, the final conversation, the final dialogue is what like is the scene that I would want most to be included in the in the books. I do think on screen, hypothetically, I think you could have this conversation. It may not have the exact same feel, but I think you could have this conversation just kind of at the end of like when Ven effectively gives her life to defeat Ruin. I feel like you could have you could have this like you know I don't know if you'd do it before you see like the people on the planet like you know it becoming normal it becoming pretty things starting to bloom and stuff like that or if you do it after that uh but I feel like you could do that like you do that and then it's almost like Ven has gone to the afterlife and then sees Kelsier and they talk I feel like that could work in an on-screen adaptation. I don't think you have to have all the stuff with the Irie and him helping behind the scenes. Although I'd love that. That'd be fantastic. I feel like in the context of a movie for Mistborn, I think you could have that scene and it would still carry weight. It may not be um, as good as every moment being in here, but I feel like it would be harder. To You, you would have to... If like if it was a trilogy of movies, you would have to see these other scenes woven into the other previous movies. You couldn't like tack all this on at the end of a uh, Hero of Ages movie. You know, right. you'd have to start with like Chelsea dies end of movie one. Somewhere in movie two, you find out he's in the cognitive realm, and you start seeing behind the scenes. But even at the start of that, you don't really know about preservation and ruin you kind of do but anyways i feel like it would be clunky if, if i'm talking about like someone watching these movies that has hasn't read the books kind of thing so what if you just have like a single teaser buried in movie two somewhere that oh kelsey are still out there and then maybe like at the very end and then Post I'd be with it, an adaptation. Yeah, maybe <laughs> something like that. And but then in in movie three, you just do this. Yeah, moving on to the afterlife scene, and it can almost be a, a nod and a wink to the readers. The readers know what Kelsey has been up to. The movie watcher just goes, "Oh, she's on the way to the afterlife," and she sees Kelsey, and they have this this conversation. You could you could you could play it such that it you get the character moment for the movie watcher. And the book reader can kind of fill in pieces for them, so they know all the rest. It's it's almost like the the Star Wars six or whatever, talking to the people via the Force. You know, <laughs> not quite the same at all, but uh, but that sentiment of like, you know, getting to see your old your old you know teacher kind of thing, um, your old yeah. mentor um, figure. So. I, I wonder if you could almost format it how Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings formats Gandalf. The two towers open, or at least the extended two towers, opens with the same sequence of events of Gandalf's oh, yeah. death, but then it follows Gandalf for like three or four minutes, and then it leaves the 
the reader wondering, okay, well, wait a minute, there was more to that scene that I didn't see. I wonder if you could start the Well of Ascension at the end of the Final Empire with the confrontation with the Lord Ruler, and you could follow Kelsier for a couple minutes, maybe him waking up in the Cognitive Realm, and then you watch the rest of the Well of Ascension as is. And like maybe you're hearing Kelsier's voice or, you know, in scenes where he shows up in the Well of Ascension, yeah. you know? I was going to say, I, I kind of like that idea. I think the best way to intertwine it, and I don't mean to keep keep going with the, the on-screen adaptation, but I, th- I think you brought up a good point. I think you could have it where somewhere in the second movie or something, you have a scene which shows Kelsier waking up in the cognitive realm like, like it could be a two minute scene. I right. feel like of Kelsier waking up in the cognitive realm and enough to show us that he is in the cognitive realm. He can kind of sort of see the real, the physical world and he can move around and sort of interact like just a brief telling of that. Then going to the story, then we could see, I feel like we could see things happen like his, um, influence on spook you know i feel like we would get to see that and well, that would give a lot more payoff it'd be a lot more meaningful yeah that um and then you would get to have that moment at the end without without it being too weird or abrupt i guess you know i just had this thought if you actually tease it like maybe at the beginning of the world of ascension then you assume the person who hasn't read assumes that any mist spirit is Kelsier. So then you give credit to what Spook experiences in the beginning of the Hero of Ages. You then wonder why the mist spirit is stabbing Ellen. You know, like, you have... There's an interesting, like, new point of view that you could approach with that. I think we yeah. need to get in touch with. Aren't they working on some kind of on-screen Mistborn adaptation? In I theory, think we need to get. I think they need so, to hire us. I think we've got it all figured out. So, just as an aside, the last like month, Brandon Sanderson has been teasing six hundred and thirty-one on his socials and on his YouTube channel. Like nobody knows what it means, but he's just like referencing six hundred thirty-one, and a lot of people are hypothesizing that there's some Mistborn. Um, announcement coming um because of the, the the writer strike has reconvened you know six months ago or whatever so in theory things are back could be back underway there could be contracts written that type of thing so by the time this episode goes live we could have already had an announcement perhaps wow anything else we'll hope that lives up to the the superstition anything else for Secret history, or just your general thoughts on Era One now that you've read Secret History. This was a huge general boost to my view of Era One. I can rest assured with a lot more, uh, <laughs> just a lot more satisfaction of how our characters ended up. Um, it was also amusing. I keep thinking, I'm like, I'm sure if we want to keep track of some stats. Kelsier has punched way more shards or gods, if you will, than yep. any other character. Yep. He just loves punching them, <laughs> which I think is very funny. He, pu- um, he punched Hoyd, he punched Preservation, he punched Ruin in Mistborn Secret History. Yeah. Ruin and Preservation were like the ones where he just, like, they were kind of not expecting it and he just laid them out. Hoyd, like, kind of fought him, like, you know, they, 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 they exchanged blows. And such. It, it was more of a fight. The, the He really just sucker punched the shards, which I think is really funny. <laughs> oh. But. I forgot about my, my homework. I signed myself homework to go research why Hoyd can't attack people. And I forgot to do that. Mm. Oh well. Alright. Anything else? Maybe it has to do with his fortune. I think it does, but I don't remember why. I'll just weigh in with... I, I still think I stand on my my general reactions to, to each of the, the Mistborn books as a, as a first-time reader. I think it... 
I, I think there were some gaps that, that frustrated me a little bit. And, and that probably came out in some of my reactions in our, you know, book wrap up episodes, just, uh, just a little bit. I think with the knowledge I have now, mainly here in, in secret history, I think my experiences with those books on a reread would be m- more positive. Not, not that they were negative throughout. I, I have enjoyed these, these, books, but I, I think I rated them, you know, significantly lower than, than Brandon's other works. I think going back, I, I would have much more positive feelings knowing where things were, were going. And it feels like cheating a little bit because, you know, he wrote this so much later than those stories. You know, those stories had to stand on their own for, for quite a while. So I think that the first time rereader experience is still there, but I think it would be a very different experience on a reread. One other thing I want to add is I think it's really neat because I'm sure he got a lot of thoughts after release or heard, heard a lot of thoughts, perspectives, I'm sure. I don't know if that actually had any impact on Brandon Sanderson's choice to write this and how he wrote it. But in my head, I'm thinking of, you know, let's say our podcast was rewinded in time to several, like, I don't know, five, six years or whatever, whenever it came out not mathing right now. It's been more than that, I think. Um, what if we were here, you know, talking and saying, you know, Hero of Ages, Mistborn was fantastic. Loved it. It was a great story. Just kind of wish we had more closure with some of these characters or things like that, you know, any of our questions. And then this comes out. Like, I feel like that's pretty fantastic. That's like your dream for a lot of authors or books or movies is to be like, oh, this was the thing that kind of my my one downside, I guess. And then it comes out and he's like Here you go. Yep. <laughs> Here here's that here's that chapter you were wanting, you know. <laughs> I feel like that's uh, really really neat, you know. And he also mentions I think this was a postscript thing, about potentially a backburner type thing, I guess, but like low priority list, but potentially a secret history two and three. You know, of like I assume in the future Mistborn eras, and that just seems really cool. I, I like, I, I at least like this format of the secret history things. You know, we talked about it would be maybe ideal for us in our viewpoint to have this like as part of the actual proper series, but I kind of like this of like kind of an optional supplement optional like additional chapters you know yeah i i feel like that's really cool because um i mentioned this i was mentioning this some before we started recording but i have two friends of mine who who are now reading mistborn and i think they're gonna like mistborn i think they're really gonna like mistborn i think if mistborn was a lot longer or maybe even just a bit longer than it is i don't know if they would have bothered to pick it up you know I, i don't know that they would but i think if they read mistborn I think they would absolutely be happy to read this. And then I feel like that can kind of hook people more, you know? Yeah. So, like seeing how a lot of the different readings really tie together really directly, you know? So all that to be said, I, I'm all for this kind of style of the whole secret history thing, I guess. Sounds good. With that, we will close. Era one, do you guys like a Stormlight refresher? Always. Alrighty. The score is six to Elliot and four to Paul, within within shooting distance for Paul here. Paul, you're going to lead this. I will be giving you a chapter name. You need to summarize what happens in the chapter. A light. By which to see. I'm going to go with this being the chapter. I think this is the chapter where Dalinar opens up the perpendicularity at the end of Oathbringer. He does his big famous clap. Light shines out everywhere. All the... All the... um. Surge binders have have unlimited stormlight. That chapter is titled Unity. Ah, 
Okay. Incorrect. Elliot? This is obviously the rhythm of war. All the lights go out in your Ethereum, and Kaladin is blundering around in the, the back hallways of your Ethereum and finally finds his way around. Incorrect. I thought he had it there. Not going to lie. That, sounded, <laughs> that was a really good guess. Yeah. This chapter is part two, three of The Way of Kings. Kaladin is strung up in the high storm. And the sphere that he is holding begins glowing. You know what? Unironically, that was my second guess. But that's okay. I still stand by my answer. And I have no regrets. Alrighty. Elliot, your quote ID. Who is talking? You have words to speak. You've started on this new path. When will you tell the others the oaths you've sworn? This is as a spren. Which one, though? Big smile from Paul over there. Paul knows he's ready to snatch it. Uh, it's not. Again, I, I want to verbally process this, but I can't because Paul's over there to, to steal my answer. I'll even. Shoot. Yeah, this is this is wrong, but it's oh, what, now I'm blanking on the name. Ya, Yasna Spren Ivory. Incorrect. Paul. Okay, so the thing is, I think I know this. However. I don't know if I could tell you the exact name of the sprint. I think this is Teft's sprint. Oh. And that is like the one sprint that I don't know if I could tell you the exact name. I think I could name just about any other Radiant sprint. But this is Teft's sprint to Teft. Whenever we find out that he's been a search bind or uh, been a windrunner. You are correct. I'll give you the point. Okay. I was wow. hoping that would count. I Because I couldn't remember the specific name of the sprint. <laughs> Her name is Fenderana. Okay, yeah, I did not remember that. <laughs> this is the end of Oathbringer, where Teft finally swears his third ideal to defend your Thiru from being under attack at the end of Oathbringer. Well done. All right, Paul. Fenderana. Fenderana. With a PH, <laughs> Fenderana. Yeah. yeah. All right, Paul, I'm going to read you a, a, a review of a Cosmere book. You need to tell me what book it is and what they rated it. I kept putting off this review because I had no idea where to start with everything that happened in this installment. But needless to say, Sanderson is a master of endings and revelations that sneak up on you. Sometimes a little too well, so you don't even catch it listening to the audiobook at 1.30 in the morning. Did you write this, Trevor? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I am going to verbally process. At least because this is kind of subjective, not like a pinpoint, you know, quote from the book. Um, he said that he says Brandon Sanderson has mastered this thing. I believe he uses that term, right? The Master of Endings. Master of Endings. Which okay. is capitalized, I'm, actually. He gives them the title, The Master of wow. Endings. Yes. <laughs> Brandon Sanderson. Master of Endings. Writer of Four Sanderings. You know. Um, uh, so I think, I think this is a five out of five stars. The ending sneaks up on you. I feel like that's the hardest part that I'm struggling with. Okay, I could be wrong. Did did it mention that this reader was... Did, did it mention listening? Like that this was an audiobook listen through? Did it mention that specifically? Of course, you haven't asked me to reread it yet. 
Yeah, I know. I'm doing my best out here, Trevor. I'm trying to give you a break. <laughs> I can read it again if you want. You only get no, 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 it's, it's fine. It's you only fine. get one request, though. Yes, they did mention an audiobook. Okay. And one thirty in the morning, specifically. I'm going between two answers in my head. I'm just going to throw them out there because I, I can't help but verbally process. I think this is either something like Dawn Shard or something more subtle. Or I think it's not actually Stormlight. I think this might be like Warbreaker or something along those lines. But I'm like, Warbreaker's ending is not that subtle. The ending isn't. I think it's pretty big. So I'm going to go with Dawn Shard. Actually, five out of five stars. All right, Elliot. Rhythm of War, four stars. Mm, decisive. I gave him plenty of time to think. I guess. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah. This is a five out of five for Rhythm of War. You both get a point. <sighs> okay. So Paul is leading two to one, moving into the trivia. Elliot, you can defend the point with successfully answering this trivia question. Who is named High Prince of War during the War of Reckoning? Uh, there's the second guessing my third or guessing myself and I'm getting all my wars confused. If, if I knew for sure what the War of Reckoning was referencing, I'd, I'd be in a better place. Because this, it could be High Prince of War. Like four possibilities run through my head. We're just going to go for it. It is Amaram. Incorrect. Paul, would you like to correct him? That was going to be my guess. I was See, like, I think like I can name you a couple high prince of wars. I don't remember the War of Reckoning. I think I'm in a similar boat as Elliot. Emram gets named like Head of the Knights Radiant, not mm -hmm. yes, he does. Or high prince of war. Yeah. That, but ah. Uh. Um, so I'm I'm struggling to remember when the War of Reckoning is. This I don't remember. I don't you, remember if that's like way in the past or if that's. You guys remember, more. this was a previous trivia question. Reasons. What is the War of Reckoning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. I don't, still don't remember. Um, named the High Prince of War in the War of Reckoning. I'm going to go with Prince of War. I don't know. Um, you, you I'm going to go for a historical figure. I'm going to go for the Sunmaker. Incorrect. The War of Reckoning is simply referring to the war on the Shattered Plains against the listeners. Yeah. And it, now go ahead. Is it Sadius? It is Sadius. Sadius okay, is named. That was actually the first thought that popped into my head. Like very first one, but I was like, no, I don't I don't think I'd so, of war is quite right. So Dalinar is frustrated with how the war on the Shattered Plains is going. Keeps petitioning Elokar, name me High Prince of War. We need to make concerted efforts towards the listeners. We need to end this war. Name me High Prince of War. And Elokar turns around and gives it to Sadius because he trusts Sadius with that that he's taking the saddle strap seriously and Dalinar is not. I was thinking that Sadius was named like a Prince of Inflammation or something like that. Is that what like Dalinar gets later? That or? is what Dalinar gets later. Ah, shoot. I had those two backwards. Well, and I think I think Sadius actually gets it later as well. Wait a minute. Is my question wrong? I think my question's wrong. I think you're right. I think Sadius is named High Prince of Information because he then interrogates Dalinar over... My question's wrong. It's not Amram anyway, so you both are incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll just scrap the question altogether. But my question's wrong because High Prince of War is not given to anyone? Now I'm questioning or myself. Does, or does Dalinar give Sadius High Prince of War later? Does Elokar yeah. give Dalinar High Prince of War later? No. 
I'll have to go to the copper mine on that one or something. Yeah, so I guess we need search. to go refresh ourselves. Any, anyway, <laughs> I'm assuming it's not Amarim or the Sunmaker. So <laughs> <laughs> we're we're gonna scrap our trivia question. Paul still gets the point for the week. Um, so we're six to five, moving into not next week, but the week after. We will have a Stormlight review. So. Thanks for joining me, Paul and Elliot. I apologize for the incorrect trivia. See you next time. Apology accepted. Because yeah, you got the you point. Won. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>